Hey squad, welcome back to the channel. My name is Mike and on today's video we discuss the silent killer known as sepsis and septic shock. I apologize now as this video may be a tad longer than most on this channel but the information is pivotal in caring for patients out there. Before we continue, if you haven't bought a shirt in support of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, please do so by clicking the eye above my head. All proceeds are going to be donated at the end of October to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. Help all of those affected by this disease by directly funding research efforts here in the United States. Sepsis begins with an infection, most commonly a bacterial infection, however sepsis can be viral fungal, or even caused by a parasite. One in five people around the world die of sepsis. Here in the United States, over one million people are hospitalized for sepsis, which kills more people yearly than AIDS, prostate cancer, and breast cancer combined. You are eight times more likely to die if diagnosed with sepsis while hospitalized. And more significantly, one half of all U.S. hospital deaths are attributed to sepsis. With those horrific statistics, I pose this question. Why in most cases are EMS instructors rushing right over sepsis and what EMS providers can do better out there? EMS providers first must slow down in their assessment and determine early whether your patient could be septic. The earlier you can determine sepsis and begin pre-hospital care, the better the potential outcome. So what should you be looking for? First and foremost, is there a sign or history of an infection? This will give us the basis for looking deeper into the markers for sepsis. The five sepsis markers include a change in body temperature. Fevers or hyperthermia is most common, however cold sepsis does exist where body temperatures are below normal or hypothermic. Tachycardia or heart rates above 100 beats per minute tend to present in sepsis when hypovolemia or fluid loss is present. Hypotension occurs due to third spacing of fluid, which I'll demonstrate on the computer shortly. Hyperglycemia or elevated blood glucose levels are common in diabetic and non-diabetic patients with sepsis as the liver excretes more glucose into the blood in an attempt to produce more energy to help fight the infection. Altered mental status is a significant sepsis marker. If mental status is still intact, you can assume the patient is still compensating for the infection. Once mental status is lost or declines, the patient is no longer able to compensate and is moving into decompensated shock. The last sepsis marker that many hospitals also utilize is the elevated white blood cell count. So even though EMS providers may not have this knowledge in the residence, if you are taking a patient from a care facility, never hesitate to ask to see any recent blood work. EMS and hospitals alike need to see three of the five sepsis markers to begin treating for sepsis. Now let's jump onto the computer and see exactly why sepsis is so deadly if not found quickly. All right guys, now that we're on the computer, I want to first go over shock, right? Very quickly, loss of perfusion. Shock is hypoperfusion. So if oxygen, CO2 or waste products and nutrients are not getting to or from the cell, we have a loss of perfusion or hypoperfusion. So that's a shock state, okay? It can be compensated or it could be decompensated. We're going to talk about that in a short little bit here. Um, and then remember, we're gonna talk all about our symptoms and our markers as we draw on this little uh, drawing here on the left. The first thing I want to say is a big thank you to Khan Academy. I watched this this video years ago. Um, I'm taking their drawing, uh, but I'm changing the explanation just so just a little bit. Um, but more or less, uh, you can find the same information on their video as well. 
It's a great source of knowledge. I loved what they did. And like I said, it stuck with me for years. So if you want to go watch the original, this is not my original idea. If you want to go watch theirs, uh, the link will be in the description box of this video below. So make sure you do that. Um, so we have in pink here our vessel, our artery, our vein, our uh capillary, arterial, venule, doesn't matter. Whatever, uh, you know, whatever vasculature we're talking about. And the first thing we want to remember is that sepsis is not a local problem. Okay. It is a systemic problem. Okay. So systemic is just everywhere. It's everywhere in the entire body. Okay. So when this is happening, don't just think it's happening in the left bicep. It's happening everywhere all at once. So here we are in our little vein and our red blood cells are doing their job, right? They're doing perfusion. They're bringing oxygen across the vasculature uh, membrane and they're dumping off oxygen and they're taking out CO2. Okay. The red blood cells, they're doing their job. They're, they're perfusing the cells. Okay. But we have all of this, uh, bacteria or infection or, or whatever it might be. Right. And it's not only in the blood. That's a big misconception about sepsis is that it's a blood infection. It's not, it is a body infection that does get into the blood. Okay, but it's not a blood infection per se. Okay, so then you have bacteria, infection wandering around in the interstitial spaces. Okay, all of these black little blobs here are my interpretations on infection. Okay, and you have white blood cells that come along in the vasculature and they try and eat the, um, the infection. Right? That's their job. The white blood cells come in and they try and eat up all the infection. The problem is, is the white blood cells cannot get to this infection, bacteria, whatnot in the interstitial space, in the cell tissue itself without a little help. Okay. They can't just cross over like oxygen and CO2 can. So they release a chemical. Okay. That chemical is nitrous oxide. Okay. And what that nitrous oxide does is it creates two things, uh, within the vasculature. The first thing it does is it creates permeability in the vasculature membrane. Okay. So the vasculature itself becomes permeable. Okay allowing holes more or less in the, uh, in the vasculature for the white blood cells to then cross over. Okay. And get into this interstitial tissue to be able to fight the infection. The second thing it does is it is a potent vasodilator. Okay. We've all heard vasodilation. Okay vasodilation. And what we're going to now see is I'm going to, I'm going to just bracket this so we can see that it was, it's not permeable, but we'll ah, the heck with it. We're just going to get rid of it. Make it more easy for you guys to, to see here. Okay. So now we have a widened vasculature system. Okay. All of our vasculature are now going to be vasodilated and we're now going to get two bad reactions from this nitrous oxide. The first is we're going to start to see blood pool in these vasodilated or these dilated uh, vessels, right? Arteries, veins, doesn't matter. Blood's going to start to pool in those vessels. Okay. Blood, when it pools, doesn't go back to the heart. Okay. So our preload goes down. Okay. So preload goes down, which then in turn, uh, cardiac output also goes down causing hypotension. Okay. 
and this is going to be your first marker. Okay. And then because this is happening systemically, another thing is going to happen. These permeability, uh, these gapes, these gaping holes in the vasculature allow not just the white blood cells to get out, but also for fluid shift to happen. Okay, so fluid now goes from the vasculature and it just floods the interstitial spaces. Okay, all over the interstitial space becomes flooded with fluid. Okay, and it also, uh, we'll get there. So all of this fluid, this third spacing of fluid, now because it's not in the vasculature, we have this pooling, we have this third spacing, we've already decreased our preload and our cardiac output. Now we're going to decrease these again, leading to further hypotension. Okay, the body goes, oh crap, I need to compensate for this. So it raises the heart rate, okay? And this is where we get the tachycardia and our second marker from, okay? Because we have a lower volume to move, the heart needs to pump faster to be able to move it, okay? The problem now is we have a hypovolemic state, right? We're losing we're losing fluid. So with that, we're losing perfusion, right? So here's our first look into why we have lower perfusion. Now with this, let's go back to the red blood cells. With this fluid shift, we still have red blood cells trying to get fluid across, or not fluid. We still have uh, red blood cells trying to get oxygen and carbon dioxide across the, uh, the vascular membrane into the cells. Problem is now they have fluid sitting in their way. Oxygen and CO2 do, are, do not like to meander through fluid. It takes them a long time to diffuse if they diffuse at all. So here we're going to have the start of hypoxia because the oxygen isn't getting to the cells where it needs to go, right? So this is where we might see our SpO2 start to decrease, okay? But we, because the CO2 also can't get back onto the red blood cells to go get, uh, you know, excreted, we also start to see a buildup which causes acidosis. And here you might see your end tidal CO2 begin to rise, okay? They're symptoms, not markers, but here's the reasons as to why they're happening, okay? Now, the next thing, with the hypoxia, as hypoxia increases and perfusion, because the cells are not, again, systemically, the cells are not getting the oxygen, we're now going to start seeing perfusion issues in major organs. The first to have this change is always the brain, okay? When the brain does not get oxygen and uh, other nutrients that it needs, it becomes confused and altered. So this is where you're going to see your altered mental status, okay? This is the reason why we see that altered mental status, okay? There's your third marker. The last one, of course, is fever, okay? We treat fevers at 100, anything over 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? That's your that's your uh, your fourth marker. If you guys are able to treat fevers with Tylenol, ibuprofen, do so, okay? As long as your protocols allow it. So now I want to come to the last point, which is compensated versus decompensated, okay? We have all of this stuff happening, right? The nitrous oxide's being released. It's vasodilating everything. It's making everything permeable. We have fluid shifts. We have diffusion issues, and, per and now we have perfusion issues. Now think all of this 
you know, before we lose our blood pressure, we have uh, uh, increased heart rate, which is keeping that blood pressure up. The hypoxia and the acidosis really haven't gotten that bad. The altered mental status really isn't there yet. We might have a fever. That's all compensated, right? We're compensating for the fact that we're sick and we're septic, but we haven't really got into that shock state yet, right? We could be developing shock in this compensated, uh, right, compensated shock, right? We're, we're still in shock, but we're compensating for it. We move over to the decompensated when we have two things happen. We lose our blood pressure or we lose our mental status. Anytime that there is a significant drop in blood pressure, a significant decrease in mental status, we have moved from compensated to decompensated. That's, I would project 90% of my sepsis patients that I've seen and treated for over the last 13 years have been in decompensated shock. Somehow, People wait too long, they think they're sick, they're compensating well, and next thing you know, grandma is altered and unresponsive with no blood pressure, and people are like, what the crap? She was treated for pneumonia, the antibiotics didn't work, and whatever. This is where we need to really understand what happens here as a systemic problem. This is not, again, happening in one area. This is happening everywhere. Lastly, I think it should be noted that in many areas around the country, EMS providers are able to give Tylenol and Ibuprofen for fevers, fluid for hypotension and tachycardia, and also now some antibiotics. The best way to help these extremely sick patients is to continue to do slow methodical assessments. By doing this and giving fever reducers and fluid boluses quickly, we increase their chance of survival. Also, it shows to the medical directors and the governing bodies of doctors that run EMS, providers can be trusted with antibiotics and other first-line medications for the treatment of sepsis. Well, that's it for today, guys. As always, stay safe out there, and I will see you guys in the next video.